take a book and republish it in 1789 um, after the Constitution is the Constitution, before Congress has enacted, first Congress has acted. In 1789, if you want to publish that in New York, according to the New York Court of Appeals, you had no such liberty because there was no public domain, even if it was 100 years old or 200 years old. There was no public domain there. So the sense in which the public domain was born is if by public domain you mean a space, a, a, a domain within which you are free to act in the relevant sense here, free to do the sort of stuff that otherwise would trigger copyright, that, ha that begins in 1790. Now, to, to, to adopt your position, you would have to say the string of cases the court has uh, decided, which recognize state common law copyright and constrain the action of people in the United States on the basis of state common law copyright, Goldstein most interestingly, um, were wrong. So we'd have to start the opinion by saying, Your Honor, these cases you decided from the very beginning, um, uh, Wheaton all the way up to Goldstein, they were all wrong. No, no, no. In fact, what I've heard earlier is that people are regarding Wheaton as their biggest impediment. In fact, this approach says Wheaton is completely right. Wheaton, Wheaton, I, uh, Wheaton's talking sense. And well, in no, fact, uh, this idea of, I mean, you're, you're really, you're having it both ways because if you, if you take it in political theory, I'm not talking political theory. I'm talking okay, just I'm plain, law, plain law. Plain law. Plain law. Wait a second. Don't give me baloney on plain law. That we are. We're talking. We're talking about the Constitution, and whether in interpreting the Constitution, you should take a viewpoint that it is a document created by equal sovereign citizens. That sounds like political theory to me. Okay, so I've done it's both. Also, it's also an interpretive theory. Okay, but let's, take, let's be very practical, Charlie. Let's talk about a recording, okay? It's 1965, and um, the Beatles have made a recording, and I want to copy and distribute that recording in the United States. And Congress has not created a limited monopoly to protect that recording. In 1965, they hadn't done such a thing. Am I free to do that in 1965? Forgetting the underlying rights to the music. So I'm just talking about the physical recording. Am I free to copy and distribute that in 1965? Supreme Court said no, you weren't. Because states created a common law copyright with respect to this material. The United States federal government hasn't stepped in to trump that through its exercise of copyright authority. So therefore, you had no liberty to distribute that recording in 1965. And that's consistent with the way in which I'm describing the public domain because Congress had not created the public domain for recordings in 1965. They did begin to create the public domain for recordings in the 1970s as they started creating a protection for recordings that would expire and when it expired those recordings would be in the public domain. We haven't actually seen that happen yet. It's promised to happen eventually. <laughs> but, but that's the structure of the way in which the Supreme Court has ratified Congress's power with respect to state common law copyright or state copyright through statutes. So when I say I'm talking about law, I'm talking about a federal structure where the federal government's law sits on top of state law and doesn't displace it unless a supremacy clause-like argument exists, and the fact that the court has explicitly recognized that state law destroys, in your sense, the public domain of the United States until Congress has acted. So in the sense in which we're talking about it here, in 1790, Congress acted in a way that produced an enormous amount of stuff in the public domain as it respected books or maps, charts, books, all those sorts of things that it originally talked about, but left open the question, there weren't many recordings in 1790, but of recordings in 1790, or the other things that Congress didn't choose to actually Make, they take a step into. And given that constraint of federalism and the state common law copyright, it seems to me a decent legal strategy in this Supreme Court to say, okay, if that's the way you look at it, here, I've got an argument that shows you why in 1790 Congress did not restore things from the public domain. Because there wasn't a public domain. Because the public domain means free everywhere in the United States. Nothing was free everywhere in the United States. You have the authoritative decision of a state Supreme Court telling you that, and you are bound under Erie to respect that. And Erie tells you, therefore, there was no public domain in 1790, and, there, and, and such so that Congress could not restore to it. Now, you know, if you could convince the Supreme Court to rethink all of its common law copyright cases, 
And to conceive a federal structure in a way that says that it created in a Lochner-esque like way a huge domain of liberty that only Congress is allowed to step into, maybe there would be a stronger argument. I just don't think as a litigation strategy that's the best way in your half hour that uh, they will have to present this case to get the court to, to come to our side. I think the court's pretty close to our side accepting the framing that says in 1790, we created the public domain. Um, well, with respect, and just shortly, and then let me open it up. I think that you're out of touch. I really do. The court is not close to your side. If you read Eldred, the court is so far into the realm of copyright, and the administration is so far into the realm of copyright. Well, let's find a way to agree. If you read one paragraph in Eldred, I agree with you, one paragraph in Eldred, but the structure of Eldred as are understood, at least in other courts, is that, in fact, there are constitutional constraints even beyond the copyright clause or the progress clause, as I tried to get it framed. Um, and they come from the First Amendment. And what this is is an articulation or an understanding or trying to work out the extent of that other constitutional protection. Well, I'm with you there. I mean, if, you, if what you say is that what you're trying to articulate is a basis for the court seeing the relationship between the public domain and the First Amendment, that is coming to see the public domain as our retained liberty. That is, that's what we're talking about when we retained liberties and allowed the Congress to create limited monopoly. Then I'm totally with you. Yeah, well, but, but the question is you've got to give it in, you've got to give them. Let me just give you one more shot at you. But, to rest in the Supreme Court of the United States on an argument that appeals to tradition when you start out with the premise that the Congress creates the public domain, what they create they can obviously dispense with. If it's completely, no, if, if, doesn't if our freedom is a creature of congressional uh, creation as opposed to a sovereign liberty that we came in with, and that Congress can mess with him. No, 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 you're misunderstanding the argument. The point is not that Congress creates it, therefore Congress can take it away. Take it away. Why not? And the point is not that tradition... Tradition is, stops them. Wait, I'm going to let you talk and you're going to let me talk? That's the way this works, right? <coughs> okay. Okay. So it's not that tradition is the foundation. It's just, let me guarantee, let me say, if in 1831 Congress had restored a bunch of work from the public domain, and uh, we would, there wouldn't be a case here. There just wouldn't be a case here because the way Eldred says we understand the contours of the copyright clause and the, first, and the First Amendment is by looking to what Congress has always done. And the only reason we have such a big opening in this case is that we can show them Congress has not always done this. But the thing that results from showing that Congress hasn't always done this is that there is a real constitutional constraint on what Congress can do going forward. So if we win this case, it's not that the Supreme, it's not that Congress could come around and say, oh, well, we created the public domain, therefore we can take it away. No, this is a way of the Supreme Court saying, you have never tried to take away the public domain. Therefore, we're not going to recognize Congress as having the power to take away the public domain. Once something is in the public domain, both for the copyright clause reasons and for the First Amendment reasons, it is in the public domain, period. That's the way we understand the limits of the Constitution. The only purpose of tradition in the argument that we've advanced, and I think that the Stanford brief have, that the Golan uh, lawyers have advanced, is to show that we don't have a counter argument that the government can advance to demonstrate why this is what Congress has always done, the way they could do it in Eldred, right? If Eldred had decided the case without looking at tradition, to sort of ask the obvious question, it seemed to me they should have asked, about whether extending a term of existing copyright makes sense of a copyright clause, th then we wouldn't be having this argument about tradition. But you take, you know, you take the cases that's given to you. And if anything is obvious, understanding Justice Scalia's and the conservative, you know, this was, this was, um, Rehnquist's question to me, when has anybody ever suggested that you could challenge an extension of co copyright? When has anybody ever suggested that? And, you know, the answer was nobody had ever except law professors. And he said, I don't mean law professors. I mean anybody real has ever suggested this. <laughs> um, so, so they gave us tradition as the foundation for the reason that Congress gets to do whatever the hell they want. And all we're saying is 
In this case, tradition doesn't give Congress the power to do whatever the hell they want. They, don't, they can't rely on tradition. So they got, you've got to either erase the clauses from the Constitution or respect a real constitutional limit that will then flourish and manifest itself as the constitutional liberty we all have to enjoy the stuff that's in the public domain because Congress has no power to remove it. And that, I think, is a beautiful liberty to celebrate, even if we've got to say those poor guys in 1790, they had no public domain until Congress gave it to them. You know, they didn't have a lot until Congress gave it to them. All right. Okay.